let us pray almighty god we bless your name for a bible study this very day we thank you lord because you brought us together to do us good we thank you because it's your word that throws light across our pathway it's your word that grants us wisdom and knowledge in the in our ignorance in the matters that pertain to our lives we thank you lord because it is your word that makes us strong in the battles of life and grants us the victory in the temptations and trials of life we pray lord that as we come today you'll grant us deep insight into your word that will be applicable to our lives in jesus name help us lord in all that we do so that we'll do everything according to your word as we come today we pray lord will not go back empty-handed but your word will definitely bring out something good that will help us to walk in the path of righteousness in Jesus' name. As you teach us, help us that we will not be hearers of the word only, but we will be doers of the word. And what we learn and practice in the word will lead us into getting closer and nearer to you in doing the will of the Lord in Jesus' name. Bless us together today. Open our eyes that we may see. In Jesus' name, we pray. Today we come in our study to Exodus chapter 18. And it's quite a long chapter. And we're going to read some selected verses now so that you'll have a feel of what the chapter is all about. Let's open and read together. Exodus chapter 18, I'm reading to you from verse 1. When Jethro the priest of Midian, Moses' father-in-law, heard of all that God had done for Moses and for Israel, his people, and that the Lord had brought Israel out of Egypt. Verse 5, Jethro, Moses' father-in-law, came with his sons and his wife unto Moses into the wilderness where he encamped at the mount of god then in verse 8 and moses told his father-in-law all that the lord had done unto pharaoh and to the egyptians for israel's sake and all the travail that had come upon them by the way and how the lord delivered them verse 10 and jethro said blessed be the lord who has delivered you out of the hand of the Egyptians and out of the hand of Pharaoh, and who has delivered the people from under the hand of the Egyptians. Verse 13, And it came to pass on the morrow that Moses sat to judge the people, and the people stood by Moses from the morning till the evening. Verse 19, Hearken now unto my voice, I will give thee counsel, and God shall be with thee. Be thou for the people to God word, and that thou mayest bring the causes unto God. Verse 21, Moreover thou shalt provide out of all the people able men, such as fear God, men of truth, hating covetousness, and place such over them, to be rulers of thousands, and rulers of hundreds, and rulers of fifties, and rulers of tens. 23, if thou shalt do this sin, and God command thee so, then thou shalt be able to endure, and all these people shall also go to their place in peace. We come to an important chapter today. I've titled this, Example of Sacrificial Effective Ministry. Obviously, we see Moses in the work of the Lord. Moses at his best. Moses in dedication unto the Lord. And yet, we see Moses from many angles. We see his family life. We see his normal human social relationship. We see his dedication to the, to the Lord and to the work of God. We see his caring. And we see the, uh, the kind of heart, the tender heart, he had towards the need of the people. We see his humility and his meekness in listening to counsel. We see the uh, way that he promptly acted on the counsel that he was given. In fact, we see the best coming out of the life and ministry of Moses. In fact, there are some people that do not understand and they do not know the value and the weight, the seriousness of this chapter. 
the importance of this chapter that we're studying has been missed by many preachers and teachers. As I tried to prepare this lesson, I looked at quite a number of commentaries. Commentaries are those uh, books uh, that, are, that are written to explain the original words and the text and the context and everything. And in fact, I see that uh, some of the writers, they just have some scanty notes on this because they didn't see the weight of the teaching we have in this chapter. But we thank the Lord for the Spirit of God that has brought so much out of this chapter for every one of us. The relevance of its inspired teaching to the Christian and to the church today has been lost or even misunderstood by many people. The visit of Jethro to Moses was no doubt mutually beneficial to both of them and mutually encouraging. The reunion of Moses and his family at this time must have been something very good for Moses and for Israel. And it is very instructive for every minister and for the Christian today. And yet before we benefit from the details in the chapter, we have to see the centrality of God, the mind of God, the will of God in the chapter itself. We're going to consider the visit of Jethro, the introduction of the arrival of Moses' wife and children, the social interaction between Moses and Jethro, the counsel of Jethro to Moses, and then the final reorganization made by Moses and some other details. But all these things will be misplaced. In fact, wrongly interpreted or wrongly applied if we miss the centrality of God and his will in this whole chapter. Because of that, let me just point out to you how God appears in the chapter and how God, in fact, is central in everything in the chapter. In verse 1, it says that Jethro had heard what God, all that God had done for Moses and for Israel. You'll see over there what brought him. Is the information, the testimony of the greatness, the goodness of the Lord. Not only that, as you move on, you come on to where Moses was talking to Jethro. And what did he tell him in verse 8? And Moses told his father-in-law all that the Lord had done. All that the Lord had done. You see the center of the discussion, God. In verse 9, and Jethro rejoiced for all the goodness which the Lord had done unto Israel. Again, you'll see the centrality there. It was all God. In verse um, 10, And Jethro said, Blessed be the Lord who has delivered you out of the hand of the Egyptians. Then look at his testimony in verse 11. Now I know that the Lord is greater than all the gods. For in that thing wherein they dealt proudly, he was above them. In fact, before Jethro will even sit down to eat, do you know what he did? He sacrificed and gave burnt offering unto the Lord. Verse 12, Jethro, Moses' father-in-law, took a burnt offering and sacrifices for God. And eventually when he was going to eat uh, with the people of Israel, that is with Aaron and with the elders of Israel, we're told in the latter part of verse 12, he ate before the Lord, or they ate before the Lord. And eventually, he had to see what Moses was doing. And what was Moses doing? We're told in the latter part of verse 15, The people come unto me to inquire of God. Do you see the centrality of God in the whole thing here? And in verse 16, he tells us his responsibility, what he was doing. I do make them to know the statutes of God and the laws of God. And then eventually, when this man, Jethro, was going to give counsel unto Moses, everything still centered on God. Verse 19, Hacking now unto my voice, I will give thee counsel, and God shall be with thee. God shall be with thee. And then he told him, That be thou for the people to God word, that thou mayest bring the causes unto God. You see, everything God was not left out. God was right in the center of everything that was said and everything that was done. Eventually, when he was giving his counsel and he was talking about the people that will be chosen and selected for the work uh, that Moses will give them, in verse 21, he says, They shall be able men such as fear the Lord, such as fear God. Then he concluded his counseling with verse 23. If thou shalt do this sin, and God command thee so. 
You see, the relationship we find between these two men, Jethro and Moses, we find that it was a godly relationship. Put it this way, it was a God-honoring relationship. A God-centered relationship. Before we pass away from that introduction, we have to think about it and we have to ask ourselves, do we maintain such a godly relationship with our neighbors, with our friends, with our in-laws in particular, with brothers and sisters? Do we maintain godly relationship with people that are coming from outside, coming to look at what we're doing? Moses is giving us a challenge that as people of God, as children of God and ministers in particular, we should not maintain any relationship with anyone that will rule out God. We should not get into any discussion, any relationship, any advice that will rule out God or the mind of God or the will of God or the word of God. Let God be honored. You remember that chorus? God must be honored. God must be honored in my life every day and in everything too. Now, we have looked at this chapter and we have, have divided it into three parts. Part one is the family reunion after a long separation. Family reunion after a long separation. Part two, Moses' heavy spiritual responsibility in Israel. You are talking about spiritual responsibility that is heavy. And time consuming that demanded everything that Moses had. Moses gave himself to a heavy spiritual responsibility in Israel. And then number three, wise reorganization for effective ministry. Not just ordinary reorganization, but wise, spirit-led, spirit-controlled reorganization for an effective ministry. Let's now go to point one, which is family reunion after a long separation i'm reading to you again from exodus chapter 18 from verse 1 when jethro the priest of midian moses father-in-law heard of all that god had done for moses and for israel his people and that the lord had brought israel out of egypt then jethro moses father-in-law took zipporah moses wife after he had sent her back and her two sons of the which the name of the one was gershom for he said i have been an alien in a strange land and the name of the other was eliezer for the god of my father said he was my help and delivered me from the sword of pharaoh and jethro moses father-in-law came with uh, his sons and his wife unto Moses in the wilderness where he encamped at the mount of God. And he said unto Moses, I, thy father-in-law, Jethro, am come unto thee and thy wife and her two sons with her. Let's stop there for a moment uh, before we move on. You see, Jethro had heard of the greatness of the Lord, the goodness of the Lord to the children of Israel. And you see, the wife of Moses had been sent back at an earlier chapter. I remind you that when uh, Moses was much younger, that he had fled from Egypt because of what he had done. And eventually, he stayed with Jethro. And Jethro eventually gave uh, this man Moses one of his daughters, Zipporah, and became the husband to Zipporah. Eventually, when the Lord appeared to Moses at the burning bush, he called him to go to the children of Israel so that he will go and deliver them. And when he was going to the land of Egypt to deliver the children of Israel, you remember, one of the sons had not been circumcised. And the Lord met them by the way, and he would have killed that son. But eventually, the wife took a sharp stone and circumcised that son and said, You are a bloody husband unto me. That means he was a, a, a husband of blood. Which means that the rite or the ceremony of circumcision was a strength thing to her. That's why she said, You are a husband demanding blood for his circumcision. It was at that time that the wife and those two sons were sent back so that she will not be a burden, a hindrance in the work, in the ministry that the Lord had given him to do. 
it was a wise decision, we would say, that Moses had taken. You see, he had left the land of Egypt for a long time. Forty years had passed. And he did not know what he would actually meet in the land of Egypt. Not only that, as things were uncertain, and the wife also did not fully understand the ways of the Lord and the mind of the Lord and the circumcision and the things that were very important to the children of Israel. Moses decided it was something good to send her back so that at least at the time when she will be starting the ministry and when the work will be so great, uh, he will, she will be over there with Jethro the father. But now the Lord had delivered the children of Israel. And the children of Israel were encamping at the uh, Mount of God. And at this time, Jethro, the father-in-law, brought Zipporah, the wife, and the two sons. We have a lot of things to learn even from this. Let us see to start with that you would not have known that Moses was not with his wife. Because he did the work of God with concentration. He did not complain of loneliness at all. He lived a life that was commendable. And he followed the work of God with zeal, with commitment, with consecration. What we find in the lives of some people that are separated from their families, we find two dangers. Number one, the danger of careless, immoral living. Number two, the danger of ineffective ministry. But we find that Moses escaped these two dangers. There was no immorality in his life no adultery at all he lived a righteous life a pure life and a holy life what a challenge to you and to me what a challenge to those who are bachelors or to those who are sprinters who have not married and yet were involved in the work of god you can keep a pure life you can keep a holy life even in that state where you have not married or maybe for one reason or the other you have been separated from your husband or separated from your wife uh, Moses has given us a challenge that at that time of separation, you can still be involved in the work of God and you can be pure, you can be holy and righteous without getting into immorality at all. Not only that, we see that he avoided also, he escaped the danger of ineffective ministry. You see some other people, they will be complaining of loneliness, they will be daydreaming, They'll be thinking so much about uh, the separation between them and the husband or between them and the wife that they will really not be able to concentrate on what they are to do. But we thank the Lord that Moses has given us a wonderful sterling example that he was committed to the work of God even though the wife was not there, the children were not there with him at that time. But then turn the table around and let's see the other side. After the reunion of Moses with his wife and children, do we read that his zeal lessened or his commitment uh, went low or that he couldn't have faith anymore or he couldn't pray as he used to pray anymore or that his, super his spirituality in any way lessened? No, not at all. It's, that's another challenge for us. Those of us that are with our wives or with our husbands. Uh, some will say, well, you know, it's because uh, my wife is with me. If I were not married, I know my commitment, I know my ability, I know my consecration. You have you forgotten the scripture in 1 Corinthians chapter 7, verse 29? 1 Corinthians chapter 7, verse 29. But this I say, brethren, the time is short. It remaineth that both they that have wives be as though they had none. Both they that have wives be as though they had none. Which means we shouldn't allow the family, the children, the wife, the husband, whatever, to hinder our commitment unto the Lord. Let's come back to Exodus chapter 18. And learn another lesson here concerning Moses. You see, Moses had been with Jethro for about 40 years. In fact, they lived in the same town for those 40 years. And Moses had married the daughter of this uh, man Jethro. Not only that, Moses was walking with and walking for Jethro. And yet, as you see their relationship, you will see that there was uh, no contempt. There was no, uh, no kind of familiarity that was breeding contempt among them. You will see the respect that Jethro had for Moses. And you will see the mutual love. You will see that it was an unusual relationship. 
can we maintain such a relationship? You see some people, if they are familiar, some people, if they are being with an in-law or with a brother or with whoever, uh, you'll find that after four years or five years or ten years, there will be contempt. There will be so much familiarity. In fact, when they meet together, you might be hearing some foolish, immoral jokes. In the case of Moses, there was nothing like that. It was a seriousness, commitment, holiness, righteousness, respect and honor that we find in their relationship. This is a challenge to all of us who are Christians to maintain a holy walk towards them, not a without. To make sure that our conversation, our speech is seasoned with salt. To make sure that all we do, all we say with an in-law, a brother-in-law, a sister-in-law, a father-in-law, a mother-in-law, anyone uh, that we're related with in that way will maintain righteous relationship. In fact, we're told that all those who desire to be bishops or ministers in the household of faith must have a good report of them that are without. And this we find in the life of Moses. That he actually maintained such relationship, such relationship that brought respect and honor in their midst between Moses and Jethro. Now look at verse 1 again. When Jethro the priest of Midian, Moses' father-in-law, heard of all that God had done for Moses and for Israel, his people, that the Lord had brought Israel out of Egypt, then Jethro, Moses' father-in-law, took Moses' wife after he had sent her back. And then in verse 5, Jethro, Moses' father-in-law, came with his sons and his wife unto Moses into the wilderness where he encamped at the mount of God. The information that Jethro was hearing about Moses and about the power of God in his life encouraged him to come. The information that people hear about you from home, will that information encourage them to want to come to know the Lord? To want to come and see for themselves what the Lord is actually doing in your life and also with the people now when the wife was brought we need to learn another thing from the life of moses moses did not say no i don't need her anymore it's better for me to be by myself she is mature she is going to disturb me in the work of the lord no not at all in matthew chapter 19 from verse 4 matthew chapter 19 from verse 4 and he answered and said unto them have ye not read that he which made them at the beginning made them male and female, one man, one wife? And said, For this cause shall a man leave his father and mother, and shall cleave to his wife, and they twain shall be one flesh. Wherefore, they are no more twain, but one flesh. What therefore God has joined together, let no man put asunder. There are some men today that will pretend and say that they are involved in a great work. God has called them to be evangelists. God has called them to be pastor. God has called them to be preacher. And they don't want to get near any woman anymore. And therefore they push away their wife. That is just a pretense. Are you busier than Moses? Have you got a greater ministry than what Moses had? Do you have a larger congregation than the congregation of Moses? Let us not use any excuse for any bitterness you might be hiding within your heart or for any lust or evil desire you might be having in your heart. Let us understand Moses accepted and received the wife and the family back. In Ephesians chapter 5. Ephesians chapter 5 from verse 25. Husbands, love your wives, even as Christ also loved the church, and gave himself for it, that he might sanctify and cleanse it with the washing of water by the word. Verse 28, so ought men to love their wives as their own bodies. He that loveth his wife loveth himself. Accept your wife, love your wife. And do not pretend and say you are so much involved. You want a prayer ministry, intercessory ministry. You want a preaching ministry, a miracle working ministry. Your being with your wife will be a disturbance. Look at Moses. Look at the miracles in his ministry. 
Look at the teaching that God used him to teach the children of Israel. Look at the foundation work that he did. Look at all the writing that he did from Genesis to Deuteronomy. And look at all the things, the great, big, wonderful things he had to do. He didn't have to push his wife away. Stay with your wife. Accept your wife. And of course, you know that the wife was not as spiritual as the man. All the same, he accepted his wife back. And so, let us understand that verse 31. For this cause shall a man leave his father and mother, and shall be joined unto his wife, and they two shall be one flesh. They two shall be one flesh. So don't give any excuse and say because she didn't understand circumcision, because she called uh, me the bloody husband, because she didn't understand the important circumcision, which is so important to the children of Israel. I cannot have her back. She is going to uh, misunderstand my ministry. And the people of Israel may not even understand her language. And they may look down on her and look down upon me. Moses did not give any excuse. Don't give any excuse. Accept your wife back. Join with your husband too. Now in Exodus chapter 18, from verse 7, and Moses went out to meet his father-in-law, and did obeisance and kissed him. And they asked each other of their welfare. And they came into the tent, and Moses told his father-in-law all that the Lord had done unto Pharaoh. You see, the discussion between Moses and the father-in-law centered on the testimony of what God had done. It's centered on the mind of God, the word of God, the will of God, the power of God. What's your kind of discussion with people you talk with? With fellows in your place of work and with your in-laws and with the people that come. Do you talk on the bitterness from family to family, on village problem, without talking on the things that the Lord is doing? In verse 9, And Jethro rejoiced for all the goodness which the Lord had done to Israel. He rejoiced. And then he says, whom he had delivered out of the hand of the Egyptians. And Jethro said, Blessed be the Lord, who has delivered you out of the hand of the Egyptians. And then in verse 11, Now I know that the Lord is greater than all the gods. For in that, in that thing wherein they dealt proudly, he was above them. Now the thing we learn is that it is wonderful to keep a pure relationship. It's wonderful to keep a relationship of mutual respect with the people that are closest to us in family ties. No pride, no rudeness, no excessive familiarity. All we see is kind affection. We see moderate inquiry into one another's welfare. Not going too deep into one another's welfare that it will look very rude, very sharp. It will look as if they were prognosing into what did not concern them. Moderate inquiry and gratitude to God for watching over both of them. Now we pass on to the next part which is Moses' heavy spiritual responsibility in Israel. We come on to Exodus chapter 18 from verse 13. And it came to pass on the morrow that Moses sat to judge the people. And the people stood by Moses from the morning until the evening. Here we need to learn another thing in the life of Moses. You must remember that there had been a considerable period of separation between Moses and the wife and the two sons. And then they just came the previous day. And Jethro had not left. Jethro was still there. And yet, do you know that the following day, Moses addressed himself to the work of God? Isn't that commendable? Some ministers, contemporary ministers today, would have declared that following day of their union, of their reunion, they would have declared it a public holiday for themselves, personal holiday. But Moses was different. We're told that on the morrow, he sat to judge the people, even from the morning until the evening. Let us remember that at this time, Moses was already more than 80 years of age. And yet, he was committed to the ministry, to the service of the Lord. Ministry among the people of God, that even the visit of his father-in-law, or the arrival of his wife, that had been separated for some time, and the children, did not affect his daily responsibility. That's a great, there's a great lesson to learn there. That you'll be so committed to the work God has committed into your hand. 
that you will not allow temporary pleasure or enjoyment to hinder you. You will be so committed to the work of the Lord that whatever is happening, that work will have to continue. Look at Ecclesiastes chapter 9. Ecclesiastes chapter 9, I'm reading verses 9 and 10. And I want you to notice in particular the connection between the two verses. And you'll see the relevance of these two verses to what we're looking at now. Ecclesiastes 9.9 9. Live joyfully with the wife whom thou lovest all the days of thy life, of the life of thy vanity, which he has given thee under the sun, all the days of thy vanity, for that is thy portion in this life, and in thy labor which thou takest under the sun. This verse 9 is saying, you have a wife, live joyfully with that, with that wife. Love that wife and be together with that wife. But then immediately it says in verse 10, Whatsoever thy hand findeth to do, do it with thy might. For there is no work, no device, no knowledge, no wisdom in the grave whither thou goest. You see, one of the fruits of the Spirit is self-control, temperance. And self-control is not only uh, talking about controlling yourself uh, from drinking alcohol. That is part of it, but that's not all. It's not just talking about holding yourself together so that you will not smoke. It's also talking about relationship. It's talking about the fact that now the wife had been brought. And you have, been, you have missed uh, the fellowship of this wife for some time. And yet that doesn't mean now that you are going to miss the fellowship day. Or you are going to miss the counseling. Or you are going to miss all that you are to do in the work of the Lord. You see the commitment of Moses, the man of God, even on that following day, he still sat down to counsel and to teach and to lead the people according to the way of the Lord. And you see the connection here in verse 9, live joyfully with your wife. But in verse 10, remember, whatsoever thine hand find to do, do it with thy mind. Which means then, we have to learn a new commitment in the work of the Lord. That we will not allow anything, whatever, to hinder us in the work of the Lord. It is a challenge that in our evangelism, in our working for the Lord, in our teaching the gospel, in our preaching the word of God, we should make sure that our regular duty is done, our soul winning is done, without allowing anything, anything, whatever, to hinder it. You see, it is very common uh, these days that uh, when people are preparing for marriage, that they take the whole day. In fact, they're going to even disturb the work of other people. They won't allow other people to even go and evangelize anymore. They have the wedding, they have the reception, and then they go on and on and on, thinking of the marriage alone. In fact, if you see what some people do, they print this and print that and distribute this and distribute that and eat this and eat that and take the whole day. Some of them will take the whole week. Some of them might even take the whole month that they wouldn't even remember the work of god anymore the workers that have just got married they will not be able to go to a workers meeting that evening or they will not even be able to go to church and have the regular service or if they were going to come at all they'll come so late and they they might be holding hands as if uh, they are the first people to get married but moses is teaching us that even though you are reunited uh, with your husband or with your wife Make sure that your commitment to the work of God is still very sound. And nothing is going to hinder you from keeping on in serving the Lord. Now let's go back to Exodus chapter 18 verse 13. Exodus 18 verse 13. And it came to pass on the morrow that Moses sat to judge the people. And the people stood by Moses from morning till the evening. Now, when it says to judge the people, that means it was counseling the people. It was showing them the mind of the Lord. Look at verse uh, 15. And Moses said to his father-in-law, Because the people come unto me to inquire of the Lord. There were people that wanted to know the way they ought to go. 
They wanted to know how to be able to deal with somebody who offended them. They wanted to be able to know how they will settle a difference, a misunderstanding between them and their fellows. They wanted to know uh, how they will settle their debts, what restitutions to make, or all those things. And Moses, who knew the word of God, they came to inquire of the Lord, of the will and the word of God from him. And he said in verse 16, When they have a matter, they come unto me, and I judge between one and another, and I do make them know the statutes of God and his laws. That's what Moses was doing from morning till evening. He will, when the people come, they came, they wanted to know the doctrine, the teaching, the mind of God concerning a particular subject, and then he will reveal it unto them. Isn't that what we still ought to do today? Don't we still need to teach other people today? And don't we still need to guide them in the way of the Lord? The things that they ought to do. Obviously, we need to do that today. Let us look at 1 Corinthians chapter 6, reading from verse 1. 1 Corinthians chapter 6, from verse 1. Dare any of you having a matter against another go to law before the unjust and not before the saints do ye not know that the saints shall judge the world and if the world shall be judged by you are ye unworthy to judge the smallest matters know ye not that we shall judge angels how much more things that pertain to this life if then ye have judgments of things pertaining to this life set them to judge who are the least esteemed in the church i speak days to your shame is it so that there is not a wise man among you no not one that shall be able to judge between his brethren but brother go to law with brother and that before the unbelievers now therefore there is utterly a fault among you because ye go to law one with another. Why do ye not rather take wrong? Why do ye not rather suffer yourselves to be defrauded? Now you can see what Paul the Apostle is teaching us here by the inspiration of God. Telling us that there will be differences, there will be problems, there will be things requiring solution among the brethren. And instead of going to the law court, instead of going to outsiders to settle those things for us, we should allow the church to settle it. How will the church settle it? The church will settle it on the basis of the word of God, through the leadership in the church. That's why we have the local district church. And in the local district church, the coordinator, the leader in that church, should be able to settle all those things instead of going to the law court and to settle anything at all. So then, we still have the ministry of counseling today. The ministry of settling uh, the differences in the midst of the children of God. But let us uh, understand this. You as a coordinator, uh, listen very well now. Do you know that we should give time? Because you see, Moses, he did it from morning even till the evening. But at least after the Monday Bible study, you should be able to give time. And then stay in a particular place after your own study and let the members know that you are available there to answer their questions. You are available there to lead sinners to know the Lord. You are available there to teach people how to overcome their temptations. You are available there to know how husbands and wives are to relate together and they are to live peaceful lives together. You are available there for, uh, for the parents to come and see you how they can deal with their difficult wayward children. You are available there to be able to uh, know Know what's going on in the house fellowship how the house fellowship is go is growing you are available there to counsel that the workers that may have some difficulties in the work they are doing for the lord so that you'll be able to encourage them and pray with them and intercede with them you are available there to counsel the people that are getting much old much older and they have not got anybody to marry and they are getting concerned you are available to be able to look into their problems and those that have problems in their places of work and they want to be able to share with you to give them wisdom as to the way they ought to go you are available to counsel them if there are brothers having differences if there are sisters having differences you are available there to see them to counsel them you'll do that too after the meeting on thursday you'll do that too after the meeting on sunday 
You see, this is the work we really need to do. It is not just a marriage committee that will take all your time. You will be available to counsel, to lead the people, to guide the people. And of course, you may be available on Wednesday evening when you want to counsel as well. Let's read this again in uh, Exodus chapter 18, verse 13. Exodus chapter 18, verse 13. And it came to pass on the morrow that Moses sat to judge the people. And the people stood by Moses from the morning until the evening. There is a part that uh, Jethro commented about, which we are still going to comment about. But I still want you to see another part of the life of Moses. This part of the life of Moses is that even though he was quite of age, more than 80 years of age at this time, yet he spent his time. Yet he spent all that he had to be able to lead the people and guide the people. In fact, we are told how he spent his life uh, by the end is the conclusion of his whole life ministry. Deuteronomy. Deuteronomy chapter 34 verse 7. And Moses was 120 years old. When he died, his eye was not dim, nor his natural force abated. Now you think about this, if Moses, the old man, could still be serving the Lord, we're not up to half of the age of, uh, of this man Moses yet. And many of us, uh, some will not even be able to stand, some will not be able to counsel, some will not be able to preach, some will not be able to lead the people according to the way of the Lord. Uh, some of us are so lazy that any little exertion of energy, uh, we complain and we say, well, I, I want to be very careful of my strength i want to be careful of my time but to see moses he really served the lord and gave everything here to the service of the lord that's a challenge for you and for me in first corinthians chapter 15 first corinthians chapter 15 verse 10 but by the grace of god i am what i am and his grace which was bestowed upon me was not in vain, but I labored more abundantly than they all. Yet not I, but the grace of God which was, uh, which was with me. Here we find the example of Paul the Apostle too, that he labored more abundantly than the rest of the apostles. Can't you have a challenging testimony like that too? that you will occupy your time with the service of the Lord. I mean real productive service. The service we're talking about is a service that will lead sinners to know the Lord. The service that will lead unbelievers to come to believe in the Lord. The service that will lead a backsliders uh, to tremble and to believe on the Lord and to be restored. The service that will keep believers in the way of righteousness. We're not talking about just hard work that will not produce any fruit, hard work, that will not lead people to really know the Lord. You see, in the case of Moses, see what he did. His hard work actually bore fruit. It's part of his hard work to have reached in Genesis to Deuteronomy that served as a foundation for the knowledge of the prophets in the later years and served as a foundation of truth for all preachers in the whole Bible. Not only that, he was very vigilant on the children of Israel. He kept them away from idolatry. He kept them away from adultery. He kept them away from uh, amalgamating or joining with uh, the idolatrous nations around them. And also, he was so much involved in the discipline among them too. He kept them to be firm, to be strict, to be disciplined uh, people of God. And even when they did wrong, he was there to correct them. That's the ministry we're talking about. A kind of ministry that will bear fruit. Not just laboring for the wind, not laboring for the thing that perishes. Not just walking and walking and walking. And there's no convert. And there's nobody turning to the Lord. And the believers are not kept in holiness and righteousness. You see, he was not laboring for the wind. Look at this. Ex Ecclesiastes chapter 5 and verse 16. This will give us wisdom to know the kind of hard work we are to do. As we walk in the church. As we serve and labor in the Lord. In Ecclesiastes chapter 5 verse 16. And this also is a so evil, that in all points as he came, so shall he go. And what profit has he that has labored for the wind? You see the people that come to the kingdom of God, they come into the service of the Lord as they came empty-handed, no convert, so they also leave eventually. 
that for all the years of ministry, there is no convert. There is no fruit. There are no people that are restored from their backsliding. There are no people that are kept in holiness and righteousness as a result of his ministry. There are no people that will say, I did restitution as a result of his care, of his counseling, of his comforting me, of his praying with me. There are no people that will say, I actually got encouraged. I was able to face temptation and stand firm as a result of his counseling. As he came, so he, he will go back again empty-handed. Then it says, what profit, what reward a seed that has labored for the wind? If we're laboring for the wind, we're not laboring like Moses. We're not laboring like uh, Paul. But if souls are getting converted, if backsliders are being restored, if believers are being trained, if those workers are being developed and those workers are being shown how they can evangelize and bring fruit to the kingdom of God, then we are laboring and we are working in a way that will be rewarded by God. In Romans chapter 12 and verse 11. Romans chapter 12, verse 11. Not slothful in business, fervent in spirit, serving the Lord. That's what Moses did. That's what Paul did. That's what you ought to be doing. That's what I ought to be doing as well. It says, not slothful in business, fervent in spirit, and serving the Lord. Now we're back in Exodus chapter 18. Exodus chapter 18 from verse 14. And when Moses, a father-in-law, saw all that he did to the people, he said, What is this? What is this thing that thou doest to the people? Why sittest thou thyself alone? And all the people stand by thee from morning unto evening. And Moses said unto his father-in-law, Because the people come unto me to inquire of God, when they have a matter, they come unto me, and I judge between one and another. And I do make them know the statutes of God and his laws. And Moses' father-in-law said unto him, The thing that thou doest is not good. Thou wilt surely wear away both thou and this people that is with thee. For this sin is too heavy for thee. Thou art not able to perform it thyself alone. Now let us see what Jethro was telling his um, son-in-law here. What he was telling uh, Moses here. He was telling Moses that what he was doing, he could do in a better way. What did he mean by that? Oh, he was saying, Joshua is there. Can't he do something? Aaron and all the people that held up your hand when you on the mountain, lifting up the rod of the Lord, they too can do something. How about Miriam that collected those women together when they came out of the Red Sea and they rejoiced before the Lord? She too can do something. It is telling us that there is a lot to be done, a lot to be done. And thank God we have supporting workers in the district. You have uh, the women coordinator, she can do something too. You have those zonal leaders, they ought to be doing something in the district. And you have those women representatives, they ought to be doing something too. I about those uh, uh, house fellowship leaders, the people that God is raising up, according to their various abilities, they ought to be supporting and aiding and helping in the work so that much work will be done. Rather than instead of the coordinator alone, only sitting down to do all the counseling, Sitting down to do all the visitation, sitting down to get uh, to get uh, to take care of all the training of all the workers. Now the other people can share together, share together with you, and much can be done. And then it will also preserve you for something more important, for something that they cannot do. And that is what uh, Jethro was telling him. He said, "This thing is not good. Involve other people." And so let us understand in the district, involve the others also. All those others are available to assist you the men and the women the children of god in their various capacities and abilities let them get involved and let them help in the work of the lord that leads us to point number three which is wise reorganization for effective ministry wise reorganization for effective ministry in exodus chapter 18 reading from verse 19 hearken now unto my voice I will give thee counsel, and God shall be with thee. Be thou for the people to God word, 
and that, that thou mayest bring the causes unto God. Now Jethro was telling Moses here in the counseling. He was showing him the need for reorganization. And he said, I will give thee counsel and I pray that God be with thee. There's something to learn there. The greatest of counseling will not help us if God is not with us. The wisest of, advi of the advice we can receive will not help at all in the work of the Lord. In fact, it will destroy the work of God. Advice and counseling will destroy the work if God is not in it, if God is not with us. And so we need to realize when you counsel a leader, when you show a leader that uh, don't you think you can do it this way? Don't you think you can do it this way? Make sure that you are backing that counseling. You are backing that suggestion with prayer. And God be with thee. In fact, when you counsel anyone, you are counseling people on their marriage. You are counseling people on the way they should go. You are counseling people on their restitution. You have to also support them in prayer. God be with thee. In fact, if we counsel for a few minutes, we also have to pray for them for a few minutes. If we show them this is what to do, even when we have the word of God for it, we have to pray that God will support them, God will grant them the grace, that God will be with them. That verse 19 again, it says, Be thou for the people to God word, that thou mayest bring the causes unto God. When he said, Be to the people God word, he was saying, Well, you are closest to God, you are nearest to God, you know the mind of God, you know the word of God, you know the will of God, receive from God and be to the people God word. That is, all that those ordinary people will not be able to receive. All that Aaron and Or and Joshua and Caleb and the others will not be able to receive. You receive from the Lord and give it unto them in a central way. You see, there were some things that Moses had to do in a central manner. In receiving the table of the law, of the Ten Commandments from the Lord, that was uh, received centrally. Every district did not receive that. Every tribe did not go to the mountain to receive that. They received that in a central way. The priesthood and the things that the priests were to do and the appointment of the high priests and of the Levites and all the way they were to sacrifice, that was received in a central way. And Moses gave it in a central manner to all the people. Uh, a lot of things that were received centrally when he prayed for the manna centrally. And when he brought water out of the rock, it was not water out of the, out of the rock for that tribe, another rock for that tribe. That was central. There were things that were still to be central. And so he said, you'll be to the people God word that thou mayest bring the causes unto God in verse 20 and thou shalt teach them the ordinances and the laws oh he said oh yes you have to establish the doctrine you have to establish the foundation you have to teach them the ordinances of the Lord that has to be done centrally you have to teach them the law of the Lord that has to be done centrally and shall show them the way wherein they must go their behavior their conduct, their lifestyle. One, you will teach them. Two, you will show them the behavior of the, of the real believer, of a righteous person, and the work that they must do. That's number three. You assign work unto them. You appoint work unto them. And that you are still to do centrally. You see, the counseling here is a balanced kind of counseling. And then in verse 21, moreover, Thou shalt provide out of all the people, able men, such as fear God, men of truth and hating covetousness, and place such over them, and be rulers of uh, thousands and rulers of hundreds and rulers of fifties and rulers of tens. Then Jethro said unto Moses, he said, you will appoint men. You will choose men. He didn't say, let some men uh, volunteer. Let them choose themselves. He didn't say, Moses, don't worry about who they are. After all, since all of them are Israelites, anyone, whatever they feel they can do, let them place themselves wherever they wanted. No, there shouldn't be in discipline. And there shouldn't be any kind of, uh, you know, take it, a uh, free-for-all kind of atmosphere. Moses was to provide out of all the people, able men. Therefore, there should be a way of checking up their ability, their, their capacity for the truth, and their capacity in the work of God. And then they will interview them and find out the men that fear God, and the men that love the truth of the word of God and the men that are not going to be partial, they are not going to have the love of money. They hate covetousness. And then he said, you will place them over the people. 
Now, did he say that you will place them over the people equally? No, he said some of them will rule over thousands. Some of them will rule over hundreds. Some of them will rule over fifties. And some of them will rule over tens. Now, if you, if you think about him, what the Lord has led us into here, it will, it will look like those who ruled over uh, over thousands, they were the next level of leaders just after Moses. Which means that uh, Moses was over the whole congregation of about three million people, teaching them centrally, showing them the way of God, showing them the behavior of the believer, and making sure that they were walking according to the path of righteousness and rectitude. Not only that, Moses was centrally telling them, appointing the work they ought to do, telling them uh, these kind of leaders ought to do this, these kind of leaders ought to do this, all that was still being done centrally. And then the next level of leaders, these were the people that ruled over thousands. Those will be comparable to the coordinators in our own case. Although we are not up to thousand yet in, in the coordinating, in the coordinating uh, the, the district, but that's our goal. That's our goal. And we are after that. And then after that, you have the next level. Those who will lead hundreds. You see, if we have uh, for example, ten uh, house fellowships, and you have ten, ten members in each of the house fellowship, you have a hundred already. And then, as you have that hundred, and then in a particular district, you have quite a number of uh, zones. Then you have zonal leaders as the next area or the next level of leadership. And then the area leaders will fit into the next level. They will gather some, um, some house fellowships together, and they will be ruling over fifties. And then the last uh, bit will be the rulers of tens, which will be the house fellowship leadership level. And so you can see that uh, just was saying that now Moses centrally teach the people, centrally direct the people, centrally handle the matters that are difficult, but then in the various uh, divisions of thousands and hundreds and fifties and tens, the others can deal with the smaller matters. Look at verse 22. And let them judge the people at all seasons, and it shall be that every great matter they shall bring unto thee. And every small matter they shall judge, so shall it be easier for thyself, and they shall bear the burden with thee. Now you can see here it said, the small matters they will judge. The ordinary things they will look into, and the people will accept. And here is where we need to counsel our own members, that our zonal leaders are there, our women reps are there, our women coordinators are there, our coordinators are there to handle the matters. If a house fellowship leader is not able to handle the matter, we take it to the area leader. If the area leader is not able to, uh, to handle the matter where we have area leader, we take it to the zonal leader or to the women representative on the side of women. If the uh, women rep is not able to uh, uh, handle that, we take it to the women coordinator in that district. And if uh, the um, zonal leader is not able to handle it, then we take it to the coordinator. It is only when those uh, leaders, the topmost leaders in the district, they are not able to handle the matter, then it comes centrally. It comes to the pastor. It comes to the leader in the church. The small matters they will handle at all seasons and then the great matters they will bring unto thee. You see there are some great matters that will require extra wisdom. Will require the wisdom that God had given unto Moses. Let me give you an example. You see two women are the arch uh, babies and in the night one slept upon the baby and the baby died. In the morning, the one with the dead baby said, No, that's not my baby. The living child is mine. And the mother of the real or the real mother of the child said, the, But the living child is mine. Now they couldn't settle that locally. Among the leaders of thousands and hundreds and fifties and tens, it had to come unto Solomon because God had raised up Solomon as a king, having authority, having wisdom over the whole congregation of the children of Israel. And when it came unto Solomon, by the grace of God, Solomon was able to deal with that matter. But you know that uh, there are some matters that even the leader uh, himself, Moses, may not be able to handle, may not be able to deal with, and he has to take that course even unto God. You see, there are some areas of counseling, some areas of advice, some areas of teaching, some areas of settling between one and the other that almost anybody can handle. But it comes to a point where it's such a great matter. 
an intricate matter, a difficult matter, that you have to go to God about it. Uh, let's have an example. In Numbers chapter 15, Numbers chapter 15, verse 32, and while the children of Israel were in the wilderness, they found the man that gathered sticks upon the Sabbath day. And they, they that found him gathering sticks brought him unto Moses and Aaron and unto all the congregation. And they put him in word, because it was not declared what should be done unto him. Verse 35, And the Lord said unto Moses, Now the Lord gave to Moses what should be done unto the, unto the person. Now you see that there are times when you will not know the answer. And as you do not know the answer, you will not know how to counsel or what to tell the individual. And that is the time you have to take that cause unto the Lord. And there are times like that when you have to bring it to the pastor. Because he has more understanding, more knowledge, more experience than you have. Not only that, there are even times the pastor may not know what to do. He'll have to tell those people to go, that they will come back. He will have to pray and search the scriptures concerning their case. In Numbers chapter 27, Numbers chapter 27, reading from verse 3, Our father died in the wilderness, and he was not in the company of them that gathered themselves together against the Lord in the company of Korah, but died in his own sin, and he had no sons. Why should the name of our father be done away from among his family? Because he has no son. Give unto us, therefore, a possession among the brethren of our father. And Moses brought their cause before the Lord. And you see here, here was even a case that Moses himself did not know how to deal with it. These daughters came and they said, now our father has died. He was not a rebel. He did not die among a Korah, Dathan, and Abiram. He never raised up his voice or his, or his hand against the anointed of the Lord. He just died when this uh, daughter said he died in, uh, because of his own sins, not according to the rebellion. What uh, they are saying is that death came, we learned that yesterday, that death came as a result of sin. And then because of that, death passed upon all, for that all have sinned. That's what they meant when they said he died in his own sin, as a result of sin that is common to humanity. He died, but then he had no son. Now, are we going to just be like that without any possession? And Moses did not know what answer to give. And so Moses brought their cause before the Lord. Now let us check ourselves here. There will be cases that house fellowship leader will not be able to deal with. There will be cases that women reps and zonal leaders will not be able to deal with. They will have to transfer to somebody that knows more than they know, to the women coordinator or to the coordinator in the district. And there are things that the women coordinator will not be able to handle and they will have to refer to uh, the women coordinator for the central church. There will be cases that the coordinator in the district will not be able to deal with. You will have to refer each unto, um, unto the pastor. And then there will be cases that the women coordinator in the central church will not be able to deal with, that she'll have to refer to the pastor too. And then there are times that even the pastor himself may not have a ready answer, an immediate answer, and he will have to refer the case unto God. We'll have to pray, we'll have to search what is the mind of the Lord. Verse 5, And Moses brought their cause before the Lord. And in verse 6, And the Lord spake unto Moses, you see, God never failed to reveal his mind, the depth of his mind and his will, unto the leader that will go unto him and ask as to what he should do. He says, And the Lord spake unto Moses, saying, The daughters of Selophehad, speak right, that thou shalt surely give them a possession of an inheritance among their father's brethren. And thou shalt cause the inheritance of their father to pass unto them. And thou shalt speak unto the children of Israel, saying, If a man die and have no son, then thou shalt cause his inheritance to pass unto his daughter. So you will see there uh, the counseling that Jethro was giving unto Moses. How they were to handle matters among themselves. Let's come back now to Exodus chapter 18. Let's look at verse 22 again. 
and let them judge the people at all at all seasons and it shall be that every great matter they shall bring unto thee every great matter they shall bring unto thee let's pay attention here do you know that there are some districts since they were formed although they are few but there's a reality that they never refer any case to the pastor they feel they are self-sufficient and yet the bible says don't feel that you are self-sufficient that there are cases you will not be able to deal with that you will have to refer to the pastor centrally in the church now this is the same thing in all the states in nigeria here there are cases that are state overseers region overseers will not be able to deal with and you'll be surprised there are some regions that never refer any case at all any case at all and yet how do they deal with those things when they do not have an answer we must keep to the bible keep to the scripture to the word of god for those of us at the headquarters church you refer those things you cannot handle you refer them to the pastor so that we can be working together the reason you have been appointed is uh, the recent jethro game so that the work can be easier and so that the pastor or moses can now concentrate on the things that are very very important i and high on the priority level for the whole of the children of israel for the whole of the people of god now in verse 23 if thou shalt do this sin and god command thee so let then thou shalt be able to endure and all these people shall go to their place in peace that is how to conclude counseling if thou shalt do the sin and god command thee so you see jethro didn't say i'm your father-in-law i've told you that is final take it he said if the lord command thee so but we learn something from moses here moses did not say jethro keep your advice to yourself keep your counseling to yourself have you dried up the red sea have you performed miracles uh, in the land of egypt have you brought a uh, water out of the rock what have you done that you are coming to counsel me don't you know who i am you see moses was meek and moses was gentle and moses was very humble that is the attitude we leaders ought to have every one of us we ought to be meek we ought to be teachable and we ought to be humble so that we can be advised we can be counseled we can be told as to what to do and yet at the end of whatever counsel we receive from anyone it has to be if you do this if god command this so if god command this so you see, Jethro did not have a chapter and verse for what he said, for the counseling he gave. He was only led of the Lord. Of course, the counseling was spirit-controlled and spirit-directed, but then he had no chapter and verse. Whenever we counsel people, it will be good to refer to chapter and verse in the Bible. At the time of Jethro, uh, the Bible had not been fully written. At the time of Jethro, he himself had not even seen a copy of any part of the Bible. Therefore, he couldn't refer to the Bible. In our own case now, we have the Old Testament and, and the New Testament. And therefore, our counseling should be based on the on thus says the Lord in the Word of God. In Isaiah chapter 8 and verse 20. Isaiah chapter 8 and verse 20. It says to the law and to the testimony if they speak not according to this word it is because there is no light in them to the law and to the testimony any counseling we receive let us match it with the law of god the testimony of god let us match it with the word of god if it is different from the word of god there is no light in that thing there's no light in the one that has given the counseling in joshua chapter 1 verse 7 joshua chapter 1 verse 7 only be thou strong and very courageous that thou mayest observe to do according to all the law which moses my servant commanded thee turn not from it to the right hand or to the left that thou mayest prosper in what whithersoever thou goest so now we have the complete word of god do not turn to the right do not turn to the left observe to do according to the whole word of god matthew chapter 28 verse 20 teaching them to observe all things whatsoever i have commanded you don't let our counseling our preaching our teaching just be off the word of god let's come back to the word of god produce chapter and verse for it 
and make sure you don't misinterpret the word of God when you counsel, when you preach, or when you teach, when you direct people, when you show them the way they ought to go. Let it be teaching them to observe all things whatsoever. I have commanded you, and then it says, Lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the world. The Lord has revealed a lot to us today. He has taught us a lot today, and we need to now go to the Lord in prayer. We need to understand that we should live commendable, irreproachable, holy lives. That our relationship with in-law, with brothers, with sisters, with co-workers, with co-tenants, with uh, neighbors, with the people that know us, will be that relationship of respect, of holiness, and of love. And it says, do not let anyone despise your youth. But be an example, an example in conversation, example in purity, an example in charity, an example in faith, an example in your manner of life. Let your in-law so see the good work of God in your life. Let your, so sh let your light so shine even before your in-law, even before your neighbors, that they will see your good works. They will glorify your Father who is in heaven. Be committed in the work of the Lord. There's a lot to do in the church. There's a lot to do in counseling, a lot to do in teaching, a lot to do in evangelism, a lot to do in soul winning, a lot to do in bringing sinners to the gospel, to the Lord, to be saved. Do that work God has committed into your hand. Don't let family life hinder you. It says, they that have wives be as though they had none. Talk to the Lord in prayer that you will be committed to the work, to the service of the Lord. And then in this wise reorganization, that the Lord has led us into according to the word of God. Do your part in the reorganization. And then pass on the part others have to do to the other people. Counsel, but then what you are not able to deal with, uh, refer to leaders that are above you. Leaders above you. And no matter how wise you are, no matter how wise you are, there will be some areas you will not be able to handle. Don't be, so, don't be so proud that you cannot refer to the pastor. You cannot refer to the leader that God has appointed over you. Don't be self-sufficient. Let us be humble. Let us be meek. Like we see the meekness and the humility of Moses, that man of God. Talk to the Lord in prayer and the Lord will bless you and help you to do more service for the kingdom of God. And let your service be fruitful and profitable, leading sinners to know the Lord, leading believers to stand firm in the way, in the will of the Lord, so that you will not labor for the wind.